tables in the world that I'm fascinated that we have the capacity to connect to each other this way. So welcome to um, Surviving Workplace Trauma. Uh, this is actually a um, abbreviated version of this per, uh, presentation simply because it is actually a three to five day training. So let's begin here with um, Surviving Workplace Trauma uh, on our first slide here. So the aftermath of horrifying events around the world have left workers with a feeling of insecurity, the likes of which have never been experienced in our history. Fueling those fires is the constant bombardment of media accounts discussing the likelihood of future terroristic attacks. attacks. Most assuredly, organizational problem solvers will respond by providing enhanced physical security doors and barriers detailed to protect workers from outside threats. This will be covered with upgrading buildings and accessing um, procedures that will purport to eliminate or restrict the flow of unknown people into their workplace. And while these efforts are clearly um, good signs to have in the, involving the workplace, the address to address the outside um, threat, it does little or nothing to address the threat from within our own ranks. So the internal workplace trauma threat has been with us long before the terroristic threats and will linger long after that, simply because of why the threat is more complex than the outside threat. Okay, and so people have entrusted with an access key, allowing them into our midst, they are after all one of us. While it is a relatively simple process to enhance physical security and to develop uh, enhanced access procedures, it is far more complex to attempt to understand what triggers traumatic stress in a fellow employee. And so we have to begin to um, look at how we keep ourselves and our work environment safe from internal trauma. And uh, again, we don't look at it and in the form that it normally proceeds itself, which is it's a cycle of home to work, work to home. So here we have um, a revelation that we should take a look at as executives and as owners of businesses. It's much more than a, another compliance burden that you have. Your employees' lives are in your hands. And when we look at some of this data, one in four workers are attacked threatened or harassed each year, costing $13.5 billion in medical costs a year. I've done some, tried to look at some data from, you, from your areas and um, it would be helpful to me should you have the opportunity to send me more accurate numbers and more accurate data. Uh, this is probably mostly from the U.S., but these numbers are, are can be um, referenced to worldwide. So 500,000 employees make, missing over a million days, almost 2 million days of work a year with a 41% increased stress level. Stress is going to be one of the major components to trigger any degree of trauma in the workplace, and that stress could actually come from your home and or your work environment and being mindful again that it it cycles itself from home to work work to home and at some point there has to be no um there is no distinction between which stress we put where where whether we take the personal stress and bring it into the workplace and or whether or not we take the workplace stress and bring it home to our families so it it, it exists there and so just a little bit about me and nadia thank you very much for that wonderful um, uh, uh, introduction this morning. And so this just tells you a little bit about my background here and the fact that I've been doing this work since the 90s. So it's not that um, I'm coming into an area of unknown uh, tra treatment and training on my part. So here are some of my, uh, here are some of our emotional wellness partners and um, of course, trauma services is in there, and we have a, a, a stopping a bully, 
bullying profile uh, uh, campaign going as well. We treat uh, athletes and entertainers and we move this um, story around uh, around the world to help people. So the goal of this, treat, this, this training is to help executives, managers, and supervisors to do uh, a better job at uh, first identifying uh, the significant behaviors that um, that can trigger a workplace in trauma and ultimately to become aware of uh, many of the concerns that exist among workers who are don't have the capacity to talk about things that are going on in their their lives and or to discuss with their um, superiors things that are going on. So we want to identify and listen to employees and be receptive to hearing their concerns, establish an environment where employees can express themselves confidentially. Confidentiality is critical here because nobody really wants their colleagues and the people who signed their paychecks to know that they have an emotional um, consideration that may or may not affect their work environment. And so the judging of that um, is probably something that will weigh very heavily on the person's uh, thought process before they expose to their superiors and ultimately to their colleagues that they are even having um, some concern. And so uh, we also want to focus on the appropriate actions to take and the support systems available to help deal with the potential workplace trauma. And ultimately, we want to be able to seek advice from consultants that would be like me and uh, your human resources. And of course, your EPA and security will create a, a crisis response team. And that actually is in the final module of this training. I do understand that our time is a bit limited today. and We will not get through the entire module. As I said earlier, this is actually a three to five day training. And I condensed the information so that we could take advantage of the 40 minutes that we have been allotted here to um, get this information out to you. So if we begin to understand that um, each day in the workplace, thousands of employees are harassed. Uh, they are intimidated, threatened, verbally and physically attacked. And this is according to independent studies that have um, been done around the uh, world. And so we have confirmed that in some instances, these incidents result in grave injuries or death. And so while the media uh, clearly only focuses on the most sensational cases involving a berserk a uh, co-worker or a former employee or even a spouse who comes into um, the workplace. Human resources and your upper management is very much aware that there are things going on in their organizations that they actually have absolutely no control over. And those things are occurring in the cubicles and in the workspaces of the people who they have hired to do a job. And so the chief problem that's facing businesses and the public sector has been the lack of information and qualified um, professional assistance to reduce the potential for uh, traumatic incidents. And that can only happen with um, webinars such as this one where uh, somebody who is specializing in these areas can bring the information and bring some resolve and solution to the problems that exist in the workplace as it relates to um, emotional traumas. And so uh, one of the things, uh, many of the things that uh, have to be considered when we're thinking in terms of workplace and how we can better provide for the employer and subsequently the employee uh, retaining the cost and insurance claims are out of control, judgments and legal liabilities. I've actually worked both sides of this table. And when I say both sides, I have worked um, on behalf of the plaintiff and I've worked on behalf of the company when it came to claims for emotional damages that have been done in the uh, workplace 
workplace. And so while, while the companies and people are aware that workplace trauma is quietly but negatively impacting their bottom line, they actually don't know what to do about it until we inform the people that there are programs and there are trainings such as this one, Surviving Workplace Trauma, let me give myself a commercial here, <laughs> that could help um, their, their company and their, their bottom line. And so um, one of the facts is, is by ignoring the direct or indirect effects of trauma on employees, businesses, business owners lose between three and five billion dollars annually for medical costs. And so when somebody is out on stress leave, when somebody is out on medical leave, sometimes the cause of that masking is that they've gone through a very stressful environment or a very stressful period in their personal and or work life. And when we understand that when they go through those things that it is, and we'll be going back to some of these questions later, guys, take notes here. We will be asking the question, it, does it cycle? Does it stop when it gets to um, the workplace? Does it stop when it gets to home? Are people able to separate that stress and those emotional traumas from one place to the next? And the answer to that is an emphatic no. And so in, in addition, employers forfeit another 100 million in lost wages and lost work with workplace trauma. Workplace trauma does affect your bottom line. And so everybody is concerned about that bottom line and not necessarily um, making sure that the people who are helping them to gain that bottom line is uh, at their healthiest and their most productive. And so your employees, once you have taken this whole training, your employees will learn um, to play an important role in diffusing situations by being concerned with the welfare of their coworkers. So part of a great part of this training and a great part of this um, approach to workplace trauma is building confidence among teams and building that confidence among coworkers. So team building is another critical component here. We actually will begin to teach you how to build that team so that it relies on each other for support and for the most critical component, which is um, safety. Safety is not just a physical um, uh, issue in the workplace. It is there. However, if the emotion is um, dismantled, if the emotions of the person is dismantled, then safety is not a concern because they are not thinking in terms of doing the job or using equipment and or walking in areas that uh, may, may or may not be uh, safe in the environment. And so we have to um, understand how to properly report any th threatening behavior or violent acts so we can avoid a confrontation with a fellow employee who is exp experiencing traumatic um, stress. So there are so many parables that exist out there. One of them will say something like, um, don't judge anybody until you walk in their shoes. And so that, again, gives us the opportunity to not know when a person is having a bad day or when they're dealing with something outside of the realm of job description that is causing them to have some emotional breakdown and or concern. So let's try and look a moment at the profile of the workplace victimizer. It can be summed up in one run-on sentence. In well over 99% of the cases, the victim and survivor are a chairman, a chief executive, chief operations, doctor, nurse, manager, receptionist, mother, father, grandmother, grandfather. So the list is endless of who that person could actually be. In other words, they are an employee or an employer. In any event, the lives of the innocent are victimized, but the perpetrator is only a single piece of a large puzzle. And we need to get to the core of that piece of the puzzle that's so critical in keeping the, con the connection, um, the cohesiveness of an organization and a company is based on how safe the people are, are in the environment and how they feel that they are treated. And so to assess responsibility for the overall problem, 
of workplace trauma, the focus must be taken off of the perpetrator momentarily and turned back in another direction. And that is our goal here this, today, this afternoon, this morning, wherever we are coming from in the world. And so despite the growing phenomenon of physical and verbal violence in the workplace, companies, large and small, are claiming to two prevailing myths. It can't happen here and it can't be prevented. Both of those are myths that have moved through organizations, companies for uh, decades now, I would say centuries, but let's go with decades now. And it is um, that it can strike at any time and any place. In fact, workplace homicides is the fastest growing category of murder in the US and so, um, and homicide is now the leading cause of the on, on the job death for women and second leading cause for men. The bad things happen to people in all different types of places. And again, the goal here this morning is to begin to look at how we can better serve the community by keeping our work environments. Um, and of course, we're just experiencing headlines on yesterday, the day before in Brussels. And so um, there can never be a more timely time than um, we have right this moment to get try to get this right. So let's start the first module here, developing an understanding for workplace trauma. And uh, unbeknownst to all of you, we have a pop quiz coming here. And so we can expect that at those answers to come. I'll give you just a little bit of time to uh, read over the questions here in the quiz and we'll talk about it at the end of the session as we move forward. But take a few moments here to um, look at question one, a window washer falls from a considerable height. Since that time, he experiences pain, flashbacks of the fall and sleepless nights. Who is traumatized as a result of his fall? The window washer and his family? Everyone who witnessed the fall? Most people in the building who heard about the fall, many window washers across the world, I should say. And so is the answer A, B, C, D, or E, all of the above? And please explain your answer so that when we go into discussion, we have a few things to talk about. Number two, Anita has been absent 12 days of the last 30. When she is at work, she often sleeps at her desk, does not make deadlines, is irritable and always yelling at her coworkers. Anita is, and maybe some of you out there say, I know Anita. <laughs> okay, so if you know Anita, um, consider some of these answers to be what's going on with Anita. A, she's lazy and needs a place to sleep during the day. B, she's in an abusive relationship at home and cannot sleep at night. C, she is under pressure at work to produce or be fired. D, none of the above. E, B, and C, and don't forget, again, please explain your answer. How are we doing out there? I hope we're doing well. Moving right along here. Okay, so where are we now? We're at myths, and we're understanding now that myths actually do take place here. And so we talk about how um, another shameless um, interruption that I'm going to bring you because it's also very much relevant. When we talk in terms of workplace trauma and how um, that affects the, the mind, the body, and the spirit, of individuals who are in that unhealthy and toxic environment, uh, one thing that comes to mind often is that bullying always takes place and to some degree. And so workplace trauma actually leads to bullying. And we have uh, a bully prevention specialist solution, a program that we actually incorporate in the next um, modules of training when we get to that component of the, the training here for surviving workplace trauma. So we are mindful that bullying also is a product of the workplace trauma as it is home to work, work to home. That whole cycle continues to perpetuate itself. 
So let's talk a little bit about survival and um, cooperation. The need for collaboration exists among colleagues, it, it exists among employees, employers, and it, it certainly exists among you wonderful folks who are out there putting these types of webinars and um, information series together. So there, are, of course, are a stack of books on dynamic leadership, empowering the workplace, and creating positive change. Unfortunately, these sorts of optimistic writings give little recognition to the really terrible dynamics of so many workplaces. Many workplaces are abusive with no easy internal way to change them. In order to survive, change the situation, or leave successfully, one has to change oneself. And that's where this um, actually begins, helping the employee most specifically to um, have some value in themselves. And so when that value is built up in them, I always use one of my famous um, uh, mantras here is that we are each an individual miracle and none of us are born with the same fingerprints and or the same DNA. So when we get to be better at understanding that we're such a gift and such a miracle, it helps to clear up the possibility of someone coming in and dismantling that pride and dismantling that um, value and thus, and uh, of course, resulting with hurt feelings and triggering me from past traumas that have not been resolved. And so it disrupts the work relationships and um, it continues again to, I cannot reiterate enough how the cycle is so very, very brutal that um, you take it home, you bring it home, you bring it to work, you bring it home and you continue. Uh, and even the most sophisticated of workplaces, prevention programs will fail unless all employees do what? Participate. And so here we are, uh, the involve involvement and the support is only possible if all employers possess the knowledge and understanding to correctly identify the warning signs of potential traumatic behavior. Now we're gonna to say today that, oh wow, I didn't get everything that I was came for today. And so in 40 minutes, um, that's not going to happen. This is a very intense, program and problem in the world. And so again, I did um, uh, qualify this statement by saying that um, here we are involved in a uh, short window of getting some of this information. And I do sincerely hope that this beginning will um, have you so much interested that we will want to continue this series until we get to the solution component here. And so this morning, this afternoon, this evening around the world, we are certainly uh, making an introduction to um, this whole, uh, uh, whole conversation about how do we get to the point of surviving amongst a in a toxic let's say environment in the workplace so let's just um uh, i have to consider that i'm the only expert here on this area and so i'm going to take that and give you a just a brief understanding of what is psychological trauma what happens here um what causes what is what does this actually mean and um the uh dsm a long time ago for all of you uh psychologists and phds that are out there who get that dsm uh understanding uh psychological trauma is any event that shakes the foundation of our beliefs about safety and shatters our assumption of trust any event Let's not minimize that. Some people would say, oh, I wouldn't leap for that one, or that one doesn't affect, affect me. Um, there are so many nuances that are cultural and that are also environmental that determine what will traumatize one particular person over another. So there is no, unfortunately, there is no cookie cutter model here, folks. And so the 
the inability to have the cookie cutter model as our reference points needs, means that we need to do a little bit more work, go into the environment, find out what, uh, what are the nuances of the people who are needing the help, and then do a much better job at designing a treatment plan based on that information and not necessarily what a algorithm would give us as a basis for what's the norm. And so there's a little bit more work that needs to be done here. And so people who have been trauma traumatized, their lives will never be the same. No matter how great the horror people have experienced, they may recover emotionally functioning so that they are not feeling the pain, the terror, the shame, the fear, or horror at the time, at the same time. And so most of us have experienced some of trauma many of us severely, some catastrophically. It is not enough to list the symptoms mechanically, so that's why I preempted that this statement by giving you what I just said about having to do a lot more work than just going by a cookie cutter model. So we know that now trauma can bruise, oppress, beat, puncture, fragment, shatter, and even destroy the vital energy that shapes our lives. Trauma locks people in the past. The world of trauma is a strange and tortured landscape. It is made up of volcano, vol, volcano, volcanoes of rage, sagging mountains of sadness and despair, frozen seas of horror, streams of fear running through pits of depression, black holes of terror, blasted fields of shock and devastation, and oceans of grief. It has three levels. So let's talk about the levels for a moment. I need a time check here. Um, basic trauma, the accidents of all kinds, cars, sports, industrial, and natural disasters. Level two is interpersonal trauma, car accident, industrial accident, an earthquake, a fire can leave people suffering from PTSD. And so understanding that there are three levels, we put in level two examples of war, gang, rape, armed robbery. So these are interpersonal. They're coming into my interpersonal space here, and it's not outside of. So the two questions that were asked, um, the pop quiz was, who suffered from that trauma? Uh, the window washer, the, the lady who sleeps on her job, who is non-productive, and, and which category would she fall into level-wise having had something, some of these experiences. And until we know the answer to that, we are not best served to help her get through her trauma that she is actually bringing, bringing to work or he is experiencing as a result of that accident on the job. And level three is develop, developmental trauma the deepest impact of all. When a person enters the work environment with pre-existing traumas, I say this um, to the world about um, the military. Most military, um, pe most people who've gone into military, post-traumatic stress did not occur in the military. It was triggered by uh, the military. People went in there into the war with those traumas in their lives from behind them. And so uh, the experience brings with it the temporary worries and depression, withdrawal, anger, haunting memories, avoiding reminders of the event. And so we have all of these areas that could be potentially affected by an individual who um, has experienced some traumatic experience in their life. And um, as an employer, as an employee, as a coworker, as a colleague, I am unaware of this pain that they are suffering. So a profile of the victimizer. Okay, the world's uh, workplace are a power keg. Employees have had enough. They've had they have exercised superlative um, patience. They have been verbally, sexually, and physically abused, threatened, and harassed, held hostage, and murdered. It is incredible that employees are still willing to go to work. Something has got to give, and a change must come. And we're at that point now where we're identifying the fact that this has the potential to be one of the most toxic environments in our lives. And if we don't 
put a stop to that toxicity, we continue to do what? Recycle it to home, to work, and we have to go in the house and our head is just hung high every afternoon from the activity that's going on around our work environment. And we're not really saving any lives here. We're destroying them as we move forward. And so the victimizer has many ways of traumatizing, often, traumatized, often victimized in the form of labels, which are often used in front of the witness, supervisor, coworker, and or client. So they'll wait until um, somebody who is in authority of both of the people um, to bring these statements to life in front of somebody. And so that is um, frequently, this leads to the witness to become abusive towards the victim as well. And so now we're reversing the energy here and we're bringing that negativity from both sides because as a victim, I need to defend myself. And as a victimizer, your job is to do what? Your job is to harass me and to keep this traumatic experience moving through my life. And so uh, we can be self-assured that it rarely is it a one-time occurrence. The victimizer will create a cycle of abuse. They will back off the name calling for weeks, even months, going out of their way to be kind or helpful, only to return to the old behavior the minute the, the victim lets their guard down. As soon as that victim decides that um, they're free of the victimizer and they will no longer show up at their desk. They will no longer be um, aggressive the way that they have that um, the victim, the, the perpetrator will push and uh, change courses on them. And that's what we're saying here. And it will eventually escalate to behaviors that will leave the victim traumatized throughout the entire work term. So how about the profile of the survivor? So researchers continue to search for the answers to this question. Is there a common victim personality that is someone who somehow deserves abusive behavior from a boss, a peer, or a coworker? Studies show that the workplace survivor is not always seen as a weak and easy victim, but rather frequently recognized as a leader, bright, experienced, competent, and expert at their job. And so in, in addition to traumatizing through labels, the victims are treated like scapegoats, are ridiculed and um, riddled by, with accusations feeling demonized. So again, the, the strategy of the uh, abuser, as always, is to continue to have their program work on their behalf while the victim is struggling through all of this emotional damage that's occurring. So they, the, the victim normally ends up unsure of plans for the future because of the experience. Workplace trauma, like any man-made trauma, leaves the victim wanting to share the burden or parent, and or pain or and take action. And so that's, again, where that cycle, it could manifest itself on the job. It can manifest itself in the household. And so they want empathy in the face of little or no communications. They, they, they maintain a defended posture and a cloud of aggression and or withdrawal. They could go either way. Distrust and feeling of helplessness is also part of the formula to keep themselves safe because here is where, what happened. Once the initial um, attack occurred, they began to find a protective space for themselves and they have to, so they disassociate from uh, and we're starting to get into the meat of another uh, training, but we'll, we'll stay very much focused here. So mostly we believe the following, that victim lies, brought it on themselves, they exaggerate, they should forget about it and move on. They normally take no action, denying themselves and those around them. No personal response for fear, pain, or horror, horror towards any actions. So the society doesn't help us very much with that. So let's look a moment at the um, the baggage of the traumatic traumatic abuse. So trauma experiences again, we said it, it shakes the foundation of our belief about safety and it shatters the assumption of trust. And the process that has to you have to think in terms of when you have ever felt 
unsure about something, where your safety was in question and whether the assumption of trust is around you. There are so many barriers there that won't allow for a peaceful and or an effective move forward in the job that when we pick up these pieces of negativity, they start to permeate between um, ourselves and our environments. And again, there goes that again, what will be the question? there goes that cycle of influence, home to work, work for home. And then we get to who crossed the um, road first, the chicken or the egg. So what crossed the road first? Was it the shattering of the trust and or was it another trauma that was triggered as a result of the shattering of the trust? All questions that cannot be answered through your HR departments and require somebody with some skill about how trauma actually works, not as the masking and the band-aid, but how it works from cause to symptom. And so per perhaps the most helpful thing I can say here is that even though these reactions are are unusual and disturbing. They are typical for people who understand how this traumatic journey uh, works. And so here we are. Uh, on the other hand, if symptoms persist for several months without treatment, then avoidance can become the best available method to cope with the trauma. And this strategy interferes with seeking professional help. There is just this whole blockage that there is no help out there. There's nobody that will listen to my concerns, whether it be from a harassment standpoint, from a gender uh, uh, harassment standpoint, from a skill harassment standpoint, and or from a um, physical characteristic standpoint point. The trauma is still very painful and it exists. And so um, if we just want to take a moment to recap here, uh, again, um, a little help on the, my time wise here. And so recapping of the first half of this training module. Postponing needed intervention for a year or more and allowing avoidance to develop could make the work more, more difficult. Like other victims of trauma by human agencies, workplace trauma survivors may struggle with questions of moral responsibility, the meaning of their pain, the duality of good and evil, and the need for justice and the basic trust in the benevolence of the universe. When employees bring these issues into the workplace from past traumas, the potential for re-victimizing and re-traumatizing an individual is great. I cannot reiterate that enough. And so when we looked at some of the um, baggage from the past traumas, the results in symptoms like intense emotion, emotional and uh, reactive behavior, People exposed to traumatic events feel intense pain, terror, shame, horror, grief, rage, and shock. And so the flashbacks, people who have had terrible things happen to them, will often re-experience the events over and over again. I, I have a, a particular issue that um, I am always um, re-traumatized or triggered by it. Uh, there, I was um, pickpocketed in Chicago. This was many years ago. And um, the, the pickpocket, he was good at his job, but his fragrance engulfed my space. And so anytime that I smell that fragrance of Lagerfeld um, now, any of you gentlemen out there, don't wear that around me. I'm actually triggered by it. Um, that Lagerfeld actually triggers. So it is a real sense of going back, flashing back to that incident of unsafe environment when you have that flashback. And so the nightmares, uh, like the flashbacks, but these occur in the sleep. As a result, some people are afraid to go to sleep and may develop sleep deprivation. Being triggered, uh, let's go back to that for a minute. Being triggered um, is often uh, people will respond to events that remind them of the trauma with all the feelings that belong to the trauma itself. I don't really feel his hand in my purse because I never did. What I do is feel that energy of him surrounding me and having to think very quickly about how to keep myself on a very, very safe um, uh, place here. And so I'm at um, 48 of, 
And Nadia, how are we doing out there? It's Hello. Been great. Okay. Thank you. Time wise, shall we? <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, as we bring this uh, module to a close here and uh, begin to open it up for conversation and dialogue, uh, emotional wellness is our specialty here, and we. Uh, we pride ourselves in using natural healing, no meds, um, and we are definitely um, utilizing um, most of the 22nd century solutions as we relate to folks feeling um, much better um, in their lives, especially as it, again, relates to emotional traumas. And so um, when I, as I go into the uh, opening this, uh, up for question and dialogue. I've got a couple of folks here that I'd like to thank, and Nadia, you're listed here as well um, for the opportunity to bring this uh, information to um, all of you folks. And um, again, shall we begin to have our conversation now? Yes, Dr. Denise. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, folks, we are open for the question and answer. You can either put your question in the chat box or you can raise the hand icon available on your webinar console. So we have okay. a question. Well, one of the first things that I'd like to do, Nadia, is to have them answer those two questions at the pop quiz. Well, um, actually, they're all on the mute. Uh, they're all muted, so they have, oh. uh, you know, sent... Um, uh, they've sent it through chat box. Majority of them had, for the first question, uh, what I've calculated, majority of them had uh, selected A for the first a? question. Yes. Okay. And for the second one as well, the majority voted for A. A and A, okay. All right. So we have a few questions out there Nadia yes we do have so can we begin? okay I'll uh, go to the first question and that is uh, why is the workplace abuse so difficult to address and stop well it's difficult to address because mostly the people who are let's say during the hiring a small business or a large business owner when they're opening their business they're not thinking about hiring people who um, have concerns about things that are going on in through their life they're thinking about the bottom line and until we get those owners and executives trained so that they can acknowledge that people are coming into their environments um, with concerns that they're just life concerns, then it will continue to be a difficult process to work on. Okay. Nadia, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have another one, and uh, it is, how can an organization know if the trauma is for real or the employees acting in this way to avoid work? Uh, again, when we, we one of the first things that we have to establish is the safety among workers. And once that is established, that actually the coworker is your team is your teammate. They're not your competition. The other company is your competition. And when we begin to understand that we're working uh, as a team for the good of the company and also to earn that paycheck. So when we put it in the category that it belongs in, then we have less of a opportunity to um, question whether or not someone's um, a, a valid in the um uh, and their presentation to their behavior. And so if we go back to that pop question, it, it's clear that uh, the, all of the, most of the people who answered A and then the people who answered E are actually incorrect. The first answer is all of the above, and the answer to the second one is B and C. And so um, let me just try and give you an example. Um, one of my last cases um, as a private practitioner in Hawaii was a young man threw a baby, a toddler, over the overpass. 
And then um, a, pet, a driver, well, driver one rolled over the kid, driver two rolled over the kid. So who was um, traumatized by that whole incident? I'm still working with the driver of number two. And so again, everybody is, has some affect from, from the, the traumatic incident. And again, when we start to not be so untrusting in the environment is when we will begin to understand that the person is not making up these stories and they are really going through something. Nadia? Okay, thank you, Dr. Denise. I hope that has answered Abdul Salam's question. And uh, we have another one and that is, is the result always positive after the suffering employee seeks help for, for the trauma? Well, let me just say this about myself. If they see me, the answer is yes. It's so, <laughs> okay. So, but uh, again, when, when we do a cohesive type of educating and training, the answer to that question is yes, because everybody starts to look at themselves differently. Okay. okay, so we have another one. And uh, what does bullying look like and how does it manifest in the organization? What does bullying look like and how does it manifest in, in the, the organization? organization? Okay, um, bullying can be subtle. And I actually have a bullying expert here. And so uh, bullying can be subtle. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a, another life a, example. Just last evening, we were out at an event and the woman was sitting in someone else's seat. And as opposed to her acknowledging that she was in someone else's seat and moving out of that seat, she made a statement like this. Let me know when you want to sit down. I want to sit down now. This is my seat, right? And so that is a form of bullying because she never moved out of that seat. She stayed there where she knew that her ticket said something else. And then she asked the woman um, to let her know. Uh, I, when so it can look like that, or it can look like um, the very aggressive in your face. But bullies are they are they are skilled at their their trade as well. Uh, cyber bullying is becoming such an emotional um, situation. We could look at this slide that's up here. Either one of these situations could be. Um, determined to be bullying from the uh, the gentleman on the left. He could be bullying in a passive aggressive form. The ladies in the middle, they are clearly in an altercation that is leading to physical contact. And these two on the right side, they are clearly at each other and both of them could be bullies because sometimes we learn to bully from being bullied. Thank you, Dr. Denise. We have another one, and the question is, how do organizations make sense and respond to trauma faced by its organization? Again, Nadia, how does... How do organizations make sense and respond to trauma faced by its organization? How do they make sense and respond to their organization? There are, I don't know, again, you guys have to help me with some of your data there, but there are plenty of cases that are listed in the, um, the America's court system where uh, juries have awarded multi-million dollar awards because the, um, and the emotional uh, trauma attack were so brutal in the workplace and it can fall under many categories if we read any articles about harassment be it sexual and or just in the workplace now the uh, co the, the courts are awarding astronomical uh, uh, amounts of money for people who are claiming that their emotion has been um, beat down and has been manipulated by the organization. So I believe that companies should start to look at what the potential of their bottom line being affected by the things that we discussed today and take a proactive approach to eliminating that being a line item in a legal battle with an employee. 
Thank you, Dr. Denise. Uh, we are we are short on time, but I have just some time to ask the last question, and that is, okay. what are some common forms of internal workplace trauma? Some common forms of internal workplace trauma are the supervisor or middle management who's operating clearly on ego and not building a team around themselves where everybody on the team is being um, acknowledged for the um, the accomplishments that come out of the team and not an individual who is clearly just seeking individual acknowledgement for their contribution. The other is um, an owner who is just so full of themselves that they've lost sight of the human resource value that's around them. And it is just about things and material things and monetary gain and not about um, helping to shape the future where the, again, the human resource in that they have at their disposal is valued to the point where not only is that human resources um, benefiting from their, their skills financially, but they are also being acknowledged from, for those skills um, verbally and with some type of uh, award ceremony or something. Nadia? Thank you, Dr. Denise, for a wonderful presentation. And this, folks, this brings us towards the end of this webinar. Any concluding remarks from your side, Dr. Denise, before we end this session? Well, I would just like, again, to thank you all for the opportunity to uh, share with you this today, this morning, afternoon, evening around the world. And I uh, certainly do look forward to having many more of these discussions and uh, opportunities to present this information to your population. So again, to everyone, to all who attended, to those that are listed here, I want to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Denise. Really appreciate it. I really want to thank you on behalf of Gulf Business Network Training Centers for your valuable time and sharing valuable information with us. And thank you all of those who attended this webinar. We are recording this webinar and it will be uploaded on our website. So please stay tuned to webinar.gbntc.com for updates or for downloading the soft copy of this presentation. With that, I'd like to end the webinar and you all will be automatically dismissed once this session ends. Thank you very much, and you all have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Denise, for the lovely presentation. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Okay.